NPR, and I'm interviewing Mr. Leroy N. Meyer, M-Y-H-R-E. Mr. Meyer served in World War II and has graciously agreed to talk to us about his experiences as a part of our Veterans History Project. Mr. Meyer, I want to thank you for coming in today and talking with us. And we really appreciate you taking your time to do this and look forward to hearing your story. You're welcome. Mr. Meyer, uh, would you give us your date of birth and where you were born? I was born in Dunkirk, New York on August the 19th, 1924. And where do you currently live? I live in Atlanta. Mr. Meyer, would you tell us a little bit about your upbringing, your family? Well, I was to say I was born in Dunkirk, New York, but my parents moved from there uh, when I was one year old, moved to Miami, Florida. I grew up in Miami, Florida. Uh, my mother died when I was age five, and I was raised by my father, and, and I had an older sister who was 14 at the time, and she raised me, did a very good job, and uh, went to elementary school uh, in Miami, to junior high school, senior high school, uh, and I enlisted in the Navy one week after graduating from high school. And what year was that? 1942. Uh, of course, Pearl Harbor was in, at the time of Pearl Harbor, I, I was playing ball uh, on that Sunday morning and didn't know, I never even heard of Pearl Harbor or Hawaii, but uh, a lot of the boys immediately started joining up and they say I graduated in June and, uh, and enlisted one week later. What was your reaction and the reaction of your friends when you heard that day that Pearl Harbor had been found? You know, we were all so young, and we, Lord, we didn't know what war was or anything else. And I, I really don't, uh, can't recall that much. But a lot of the boys joined up before they graduated, uh, uh, enlisted in different services. So I uh, say I waited until I graduated and then signed up the following week. How did your family feel about your enlisting? My dad felt all right about it. He, he wasn't that much concerned. Of course, my sister, who raised me, she was she didn't like it. Uh, you know, who are you gonna get killed and all that kind of stuff? But uh, she accepted it. And, uh, Would you tell us about your your training, where where you were trained, and any experiences that uh, particularly come to mind while you were training? Well, I went. Of course, I went to boot camp at Unit X in Norfolk, Virginia. And then I uh, stayed stayed there in Norfolk for a couple of months, I guess. And then went to Memphis, Tennessee, to the uh, Naval Air uh, Training Center there. Uh, in fact, we were in the very first class that started there and graduated from there. It was in September of '42. Graduated in February of '45. Uh, trained, uh, went to school to learn to be an aviation machinist mate. After graduation, we went to Purcell, Oklahoma, for gunnery school. Uh, and I think we were there for probably a couple of months. Uh, of course, the Navy just volunteered us to be uh, gunners on. Uh, Different kind of airplanes. Uh, you didn't. You didn't actually go. By, they told you you were going to be it. Uh, but uh, I say we uh, went to uh, Purcell, Oklahoma, to gunnery school. And then when I graduated from there, went to Jacksonville to the uh, Naval Air Operations uh, Center. I think it was called at Jacksonville to Air Base and took. Uh, operational training in torpedo bombers. I was a gunner, a turret gunner, and a torpedo bomber. And I forgot exactly how many uh, months. We were probably there a month or two. And then went to Norfolk, Virginia. They put us in a, what they call
called a cashew unit, which was a kind of a supply unit for personnel to go on carriers. And uh, we sat around there sweeping hangers for uh, I don't know how long. And a friend of mine and I, we got tired of it and said we didn't come in the Navy to sweep hangers, so we went and told them that we wanted to go to sea. So it was just a short time after that, we were assigned to Composite Squadron 1, uh, which was uh, serving on board the various aircraft carriers. Uh, and what we would do, we would go from Norfolk, Virginia, go out in the Atlantic and hunt submarines, German submarines, pull into Casablanca, uh, Africa, and stay there for, I don't know, a week, ten days to resupply and go back out in the Atlantic uh, and uh, hunt for more submarines. And now during this period, you were actually stationed on the aircraft carrier. We were on, I was on the aircraft carrier. Uh, we, we did that, let's say we were on the USS Card at that time, and the card and its air group and the uh, escort vessels, uh, I forgot the Barry and the, uh, the names of them, but uh, we received a presidential unit citation for sinking more submarines in any unit in naval history. We have a picture that you brought of the card. I, I'm going to have you hold that up so we can show that on the tape. What were the living conditions like on the submarine? I mean, excuse me, on the aircraft carrier? Well, yeah, they were satisfactory. They had to be satisfactory. You didn't have much choice. Uh, you know, you slept in uh, fold-down bunks, uh, metal bunks that uh, I guess they were all right. I didn't have too much room to complain. Uh, we say we were on the car, and generally speaking, I think those tours took another couple of months each tour. Would you describe the, in some detail when you would go out, number one, when you would take off from the aircraft carrier and go look for the submarines? Uh, we, I mean, just describe the process once you would well, detect one. Generally speaking, we took off four o'clock in the morning, four, because the submarines in those days were battery operated, and they had to come up on the surface to recharge their batteries. So the best time to find them was right at the crack of dawn. Uh, we would take off, uh, for, I think, it was about four o'clock. Uh, you had some of the planes would fly, and they'd fly sectors, go out and come back, and another would go out here and come back, uh, and we'd hunt for, hunt for the submarines. Well, you didn't always find them. Uh, I never did find one, but uh, uh, we, and I think it was on the card, we sank one German submarine and took 44 prisoners off of it. Really? Yeah, the, the, the crewman, the captain wanted to, from the stories that were told, the captain wanted to take the submarine back down. And the uh, crewman said, no, we're not going down again. We're going to surrender. And they surrendered. And, uh, we, we took them aboard the carrier. Uh, one of the prisoners was uh, educated at Princeton University. Really? And they said that when he of course, I think the uh, American, uh, when they came aboard, we had, and this is stories that I've been told, uh, we had people that could understand German, and they mingled them in, in with them. Yeah. And uh, when they came aboard, one of the fellows looked up at the radar on the aircraft carriers, said, man, look at that, air, look at that radar, you know. Said, no wonder we've been caught. Right. But, uh, uh, 
Did you have any exposure to the uh, German POWs? As far as just, talking to just, them? No, not no, not to talk to them. I mean, they they were treated in humane yeah. uh, manner. Uh, they uh, brought them up on the flight deck to exercise, and mm -hmm. I think they had comfortable quarters and uh, uh, ate in the mess hall. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, okay, well, continue with your. Experience. We were on, when we came back, uh, the, the carrier would come back to Norfolk and then we'd go to one of the outlying fields there in Norfolk, Fentress, uh, or I forgot the others, and you know, train for maybe a month or two, uh, dropping depth charges and that, and then we'd get on board another carrier. So the second one we were on was USS Block Island, and we did the same thing. Mm -hmm. We'd go out in the Atlantic and cruise up and down the Atlantic, hunting for submarines, uh, pull in the Casablanca, uh, refuel, replenish, uh, come back out, come back to Norfolk, and again go to one of the outlying fields for uh, training, recreation, whatever you want to call it, uh, and then we went on the third carrier, which was a Croatan, uh, and uh, did the same thing. I think it was in April of 44 that uh, VC-1 was decommissioned, and I was assigned to Torpedo Squadron 45, which was just being commissioned. Uh, I think we were commissioned on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, I was lucky. I was since I had experience flying as a gunner and my and the radio man that flew with me. Uh, also, since we were the only two that had any experience, we were assigned to fly with the commanding officer of the Torpedo Squadron, uh, Lieutenant John Pagari. Uh, and uh, so we trained in Martha's Vineyard. Uh, then we went to Squantum Naval Air Station in uh, Boston, which was part of Boston. We flew down to Boca Chica, which is out off of Key West, mm -hmm. for some training and dropping torpedoes and what have you, but, uh, so... What, what type of plane were you flying? What, what, I was flying, well, it, the, when they first came out, they were called TBFs. Okay. T, the, the, the symbol F stood for Grumman, okay. Torpedo Bomber Grumman. Then later on, uh, General Motors started making some of them, and they came... They became TBMs. Uh, so uh, we have a picture of a TBM as well as a F6F here, I believe. I'd like to get that, get those on the okay. tape too. How big was the crew? How many people were there? Three. The pilot, uh, the radio man who sat down in the bilge of the plane, and then the gunner who was up on the uh, in the turret. Okay. Thank you. There wasn't an awful lot of room in those turrets. That's why. That's why they picked all the young boys that still only weighed maybe <laughs> 115 pounds or something, so you could get in there. Was it? So it was really. They were. They were really tw tight quarters in that well, turret. You know, yeah. They didn't. At that time, they didn't seem that tight, but. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, they were tight. Did the turret rotate? Oh yeah, you had yeah. a uh, gun handle up yeah. here that you could maneuver up and down, gotcha. swing the turret back and forth. And you could swing it out to, uh, I don't know what, what would that be, 180 degrees from yeah. one side to the yeah. other and up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I flew backwards in the turret. Uh, 
it's like I'm sitting here. Mm -hmm. I'd be the pilot would okay. be up here and then fly backwards and I can swing around here. Uh, and, uh, okay. But, uh, okay. Would you continue with your experiences? Well, let's say we went. Uh, we went to uh, San Diego after training there in the States uh, for several months. We went to San Diego and got aboard one of the large carriers uh, and went to Hawaii. Uh, uh, Kaneohe, I've forgotten the name of the... But anyway, we trained, we trained there for a month or two. Uh, and uh, which was very nice duty, <laughs> but uh, now, when was this? Now, when when you went to Hawaii, uh, approximately? Uh, I'm gonna say August, September '44. Okay. Because we went on board a uh, an army troop transport, and that was the worst experience that oh. I had in oh. the whole war. Describe that, it, please. Oh God, it was just horrible. Uh, you know, it was just packed with people. Half the time you slept up on the on the deck. You didn't go go down there where your uh, side bunk was. Uh, the food was horrible. Uh, I swear some of the eggs were green. The uh, meat had hair on it. I, I may be exaggerating, but that's the way it felt at that time. And we pulled into Guam and went on board the USS San Jacinto, which was a Independence-class carrier. And this was, according to your notes here, November 30th, 1944? November 30th, okay. 1944. Okay, thank you. We, we unloaded and immediately set out to sea uh, to uh, start operations. For the first week or more, I guess we did more or less uh, training programs, getting the pilots used to landing and uh, taking off on the taking off and landing on the carrier. Uh, but it was sometime early in December. Uh, we made our first strike, which was on a little airfield up in the northern part of Luzon called. A Perry, A P A R R I, a Perry Airfield. Uh, from there, I think we made a strike or two on Formosa, which is now Taiwan. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> immediately after that, we got the fleet got caught in a uh, one of the worst typhoons the Pacific has ever seen. And a lot of people have blamed Bull Halsey for getting us into that thing. I mean, uh, we, went, we went into that thing with a complement of, uh, I think it was about 24 fighter planes and 12 torpedo bombers. I mean, they were all lashed down on the hangar deck or the flight deck. And when we came out, I think we had one of each. I may, may be wrong there. I mean, the rest of them had broken loose. We had pushed them over the side. You had three destroyers which are supposed to be non-capsizable, three destroyers, capsized, with all the men on them. I think there were a few rescued. And there's a very good uh, book, I've forgotten, I have a copy of it, and I've forgotten the name of it right now, that ex explains, it's written by one of the captains of one of, the, one of those destroyers. So uh, we had to go back to Ulithi, which was a atoll out there where the ships pulled in to refuel and uh, replenish. We had to go back there for repairs. And I don't know how long we stayed there, but then we started out again and went uh, uh, back to Formosa and the uh, islands the Aishima Islands up and down from, that run from Japan down to, uh, uh, towards Formosa, South China Sea. In fact, I think uh, 
Ernie Pyle was killed on one of them. Yeah. We lost a pilot uh, down there. Uh, uh, Ensign Sharp, who by the way was from Atlanta. Really? Yeah. And, uh, but uh, we, we continued just running back and forth from from Mosa up to uh, we never did bomb Okinawa at that time, but then on February the 16th, we were on the first Navy carrier raid on Tokyo, other than Jimmy Doolittle's raid. We, you were part of that? Yes. Describe that. We, uh, uh, we bombed an aircraft factory, uh, Aota Aircraft Factory, which was really about 40 miles on the other side of Tokyo. Huh. Going in, I don't know how many planes we had, we probably had two or three hundred planes going into different places. They weren't all going to that aircraft factory. But we uh, flew in and came in over the coast and you could see Japanese airfields down there just loaded with airplanes. But no, none of them taken off or anything because huh. I think they were very, very low on fuel and pilots. But anyway, we flew in and uh, flew past the aircraft factory and then made our dive down. Uh, and when we made our dive down, then the uh, Japanese planes attacked us. Uh, uh, I may have notes in there somewhere. I think there's probably about 40 all told uh, they came in out of the sun uh, from behind us, and, but we, of course, we were escorted with a large number of F-6F fighter planes, mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, of course, the fighters just, I think they shot down 20-something of the Japanese, but we came down from probably 20, 22,000 feet, uh, you know, dive bombing. Yeah and dropped their bombs and then straightened out and just probably were flying not, flying not more than a few thousand feet off the ground all the way heading back to the ocean trying to get out of there, uh, which we did. What, was we, your, what were your feelings going in there as far as it's, fear or It's kind of hard to say or? now. I'm, I'm sure I was uh, concerned. Uh, I don't know that I was really Scared, I guess maybe I might have been. I don't. It's not kind of hard to say now, uh, but uh, we were glad to get back to the carrier. And uh, oh, we bombed. I say bombed. Uh, from then, that was just a week before the invasion of Iwo Jima, okay. <clears throat> and we were in on the invasion of Iwo Jima. Bombed. Mount Suribachi, uh, but the day, the morning of the invasion, of course, we took off early, probably before dawn was over, and you could see the landing ships, the troops in the landing ships circling around, and, and then they get the word, and they all head in towards the beaches, and I was very, very thankful that I was up in the air and not in one of those uh, one of those uh, landing craft. But we bombed uh, uh, Iwo Jima for several days. I don't know how many times. Uh, but, uh, Did you receive uh, significant ground fire as you were bombing? Uh, I'm sure we received some, but I can't remember exactly. It was the uh, Ground fire would vary depending on where you were, you know, I mean, what uh, targets you had. But, uh, uh, let's say we were in on Iwo Jima. Could you describe what you saw as you were bombing a after the invasion, after we landed and our troops were on the well, ground? We'd just, we'd just fly over and they'd, you know, the pilot had a target, uh, different targets, might have been a airfield, it might have been a, some kind of place where 
Japanese soldiers were supposed to be uh, embedded, uh, flying over. And then, of course, I couldn't just hardly sell because I'm flying backwards. I'm yeah. I'm looking for Japanese planes, uh, but we we ran into some pretty heavy flak at different places, Formosa, uh, and uh, and say Iwo Jima. Then on uh, uh, April the first, April Fool's Day, was the invasion of Okinawa. And we were in on that. We flew in on the invasion of Okinawa, uh, supported the landings of the troops. Uh, there again, bombing, I don't know, different, uh, I wasn't privy to the you know, exact targets. Uh, I'm sure some of them were airfields, some of them were uh, Japanese uh, places where they were all entrenched. And we did that for several days, and we ran into anti-aircraft fire there. Did you run into many Japanese uh, fighters that were trying no, to attack you? No, uh, but we did, and one of the worst parts of the war was, the, was at Okinawa was the kamikaze planes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they came, they were just like hornets coming out of a, a nest. Uh, we had them attack our ship. In fact, I have a little piece of a kamikaze plane that crashed right really? off of the, the ship, and the, huh. part of it blew up on the on the deck. Now I've got that. Gosh. But I mean, we had kamikazes coming out of uh, everywhere. Uh, were you on board when the uh, kamikaze came? We were, on board, we were on board the carrier. Yeah. Yes. Describe uh, that. Huh? Describe that incident. <laughs> Well, that was one time, one of them, I think I was down on the fantail and looking out, and you could see this kamikaze plane coming in. And he kept coming, and he kept coming, and he kept coming. And you ever talk about having your knees shake, uh, you know, from fear or whatever? Uh, my knees actually started trembling. Um, and I think that's the one that just crashed off of the... Uh, side of the ship. We weren't hit. We we were lucky. We were never hit. Uh, and uh, I'm on, I'm on, I think it was during the Okinawa invasion. We were taken off on a uh, flight. I've forgotten exactly where it was. And when the planes took off, of course I was in the very first plane that always took off since I flew with the commanding officer. Yeah. We'd take off and fly out ahead of the carrier, I don't know how far, and then we would turn back and then the other planes as they took off they would come in and uh, join up and just as we were coming then you fly back past your carrier and as we were flying past our carrier the USS Franklin was right out here to the, uh, I could see it very easily. And it had just been hit by a kamikaze plane. They had a flight deck full of planes loaded with gas, loaded with bombs. And uh, uh, that thing burned for days. Uh, but they finally saved it. Uh, but these kamikaze planes, most, they never attacked our planes. They would kind of sneak in. We had one, I think, uh, we had bombed Formosa and we were coming back and this kamikaze plane apparently flying right down on the water followed us back and crashed into the uh, Ticonderoga. And uh, so uh, they were sneaky but uh, that was the most, uh, you know, as far as damage uh, or from other planes was the kamikaze planes. Uh, I think it was a week or so after the invasion of Okinawa. Of course, the B-29s were bombing 
Tokyo, Japan, and they spotted the Japanese fleet coming out of the Sea of Japan. There was a battleship, battleship Yamato, three cruisers, and I think there were six destroyers. They were trying to sneak out of the Sea of Japan. From what we, what I've understood since, it was supposed to be a suicide mission. They were going down to Okinawa to uh, uh, do whatever they could do. I don't know what they would do. So, let's say the B-29 spotted them, and the carriers, we probably sent 400 planes after them to attack them. They did not have a single airplane, air cover, not one. The Amato had the largest guns of any ship anywhere, 17-inch guns. They were firing the 17-inch guns at us. Uh, but we had, as I say, we had these planes coming in, fighter planes, dive bombers, torpedo bombers. And the torpedo bomber from the USS San Jacinto, we got credit for sinking one of the one of the destroyers. Uh, uh, this, let me pencil over there, sir. Let me just, just, you know, just I'm going to show you something. Let me have your pencil. Like these are the destroyers here, uh, and, and I say there were six of them: three cruisers and the battleship. And the torpedo bombers get down here right on the water. Uh, I don't, I'm not exactly sure how high, 50 feet, 100 feet, and you're all coming in, there were nine of us, all coming in like this, and you drop your torpedoes. And going in, of course I was facing backwards, and the minute we dropped the torpedoes, the plane swung around this way, and I was looking right at the, the destroyer, and you could see the men on the ship shooting at us, but then as those torpedoes got closer, you could see them shooting down in the water, trying to uh, explode the torpedoes coming in. And those torpedoes hit that ship, and it was gone in two or three minutes. It wow. went down. But out of all of those ships, I've heard different stories that uh, every one of them was sunk. I don't know how many men the Japanese lost. Of course, that battleship probably had 5,000 men on it. And then you had the cruisers and the destroyers. Uh, and I say, I don't know, I have any idea, but there was not one of them was saved. Not one. Uh, that was certainly a major event. Yes, and, uh, it was. And, uh, in fact, I think one of these air medals we got was for sinking that, <coughs> sinking that uh, destroyer. Uh, I think we made, as I recall, we made several other uh, bombing raids on Japan, Kyushu, uh, whatever. But then uh, uh, we were relieved. Uh, I don't know, this is kind of an interesting, I say interesting, it may be interesting, it may not. I was in Torpedo 45, and we replaced Torpedo 51, and that's George Bush Sr. was a pilot in that. Really? Yeah. Wow. So uh, we replaced him. I'm glad we did. Yeah. Uh, but any, Did you ever get to meet him? No. I understand that the uh, ship had, because this San Jacinto was named after, you know, San Jacinto, yeah. Texas. Yeah. I understand that uh, uh, when they had one of their reunions out there, that, or maybe it was in, uh, they had a reunion in uh, Annapolis or someplace, and he invited them all to the White House. Oh, really? and, uh, but, uh, and then we were, we were replaced. Uh, I think it was in late April or early May. Do I have it in my notes there? 
when you dis disembarked from the gent sent yeah, them a return to Hawaii? Uh, May, May 1st, 1945. May 1st. They kept them, they, the journey kept the air groups on board the carriers for six months. And uh, of course from then we came back, we went on board a uh, one of the bigger car uh, carriers, I think it was the Intrepid, that had been hit by a kamikaze plane and severely damaged, mm -hmm. and it had to come back to the uh, Hawaii or the States to be repaired, and we came back on that. I'd like to return for a minute to your experiences, Okinawa, Iwo Jima, Japan. I've always read and heard about the experience of coming back from a mission and finding out who made it back and who didn't yeah, make it back. Yeah, I uh, well, we lost, uh, I think there's a, somebody that's in here, uh, we lost several men. Uh, we lost one uh, going in uh, to uh, Formosa. Well, here's a list. Uh, Ensign Frisbee and his crew, they just disappeared. You know, you couldn't break radio silence. And it seemed like a good part of the time when we took off on these missions, we took off in bad weather, cloudy weather. It was uh, overcast weather going in. I don't know if they ever knew what happened to him and his crew, whether he just got lost. Of course, you couldn't break radio silence. Yeah. But they never did find him. Uh, we had another uh, pilot and his crew. They were shot down over uh, French Indochina, uh, but they were rescued. Oh. Uh, the French, uh, the French government uh, rescued them and got them back to that thing. Got them over to China and somehow yeah. they got they got back. And then we had a. Uh, this is a Ensign Sharp, who was from Atlanta, and uh, he was either shot down or they don't know what happened. I don't yeah. think what he just flew right down into the ground, whether he was hit or whether yeah. something went wrong with the plane or yeah. what. And then, uh, then uh, the next day, another plane, uh, Lieutenant Dyser. Uh, they just have him missing in action. They don't have him. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know what happened to him. Yeah. So we lost some men. Yeah. But uh, was it yeah, tough to you know, come and back? I, and I think you know. I'm, it's kind of hard to think back. You know, I'm 81 years old. You're thinking back 60 something years. Just what your feelings were mm -hmm. when one of the planes didn't return. I'm sure yeah. you were concerned, but. Uh, you know, you're 17, 18, 19 years old. Uh, you don't give it a lot of thought. Yeah. I know. Of course, I wasn't married. Uh -huh. You know, uh, but I, you could tell the difference in the boys uh, who had gotten married just prior to going out to sea, because they were a lot. You know more concerned yeah, and, uh, yeah. than they uh, were if you were single. Yeah. It was a big thrill, yeah. uh, taking off, flying over some place and bombing, and coming back. And, uh, it was it, it was a big thrill. You didn't. I don't think you you, you didn't dwell on it. Yeah. That I recall. Yeah. Uh, so, but it was quite an experience. You received a no number of uh, medals, and we've got the, the commendations here signed by various secretaries of the Navy. W would you describe the medals well, you received and what you I, received them I for? I received, I actually got seven air medals. You really got one, and you got six gold stars. And you got an air medal awarded to you for every five missions that you flew. 
and then the Distinguished Flying Cross, uh, I, think that, I think that was for 25 missions or might have been for, uh, blah, blah, blah. that's the air medal, second air medal, but uh, I think we got one for the torpedo run on the Japanese fleet. Here's the Distinguished Flying Cross. Would you hold up the commendation for the Distinguished Flying Cross? And it's signed by Forrestal? James Forrestal on the right. Uh, this is the Distinguished Flying yeah. Cross here. I'd also like to get a picture of you receiving one of your awards. Oh, I I the front, yeah. Right. Would you describe that this event? Pi this picture shows me being awarded the Air Medal by Captain Carnoodle, of the, who was the captain of the San Jacinto. This one over here. Can I move? You can just leave it still. I can just this move the camera. This one here, I'm receiving the Distinguished Flying Cross from Admiral Jocko Clark, who was the Admiral in charge of the task force. Uh, Well, I know you're proud, and you should be proud of it. I am. It's, uh, uh, you know, but, uh, you know, you had, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of young boys, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old, did the same thing. Uh, you just did, you didn't question it, you just did it. It was a great experience, and I'm glad I lived through it. Well, we are too. Yeah. Uh, now, you, at this point, you're back in Hawaii, is that correct? Well, we came to Hawaii, and uh, I can't remember how long we stayed in Hawaii, but I think from, from there we continued on to, uh, oh, it's California, one of the, one of the uh, Oakland, California, I think it was. Yeah. But uh, and that's where we got off of the off of the ship. Now, were you getting any indication that you might be involved in an invasion of Japan? I don't recall any. You know, we may have, we might have talked about it and casually in passing, but I don't remember any uh, serious uh, discussions about it with the other crewmen. Where were you and what were your feelings when uh, we dropped the two bombs on Japan that, in effect, I was mighty happy. Well, I'll tell you what, at that time I was going to. Uh, Advanced Aviation Machinist Mate School in Norman, Oklahoma. And I was on what they call a minority cruise enlistment. You signed up, because I signed, joined at 17, you signed up until the day before you're 21. So this was in August of uh, 45. My birthday is August the 19th. And I say we were out there, and I had talk, thought about it a number of times, going down to the administration building and re-enlisting. I don't know that I don't think it made any difference, but I never did. And then, of course, they dropped the first atomic bomb. I think it was August the fifth, uh, and then uh, the second one 
a couple days later, where Japan surrendered, and they say we were out of there. I was discharged on September the 30th. So I mean, they got you out in a hurry. Yeah. They didn't want you hanging around. Was there a big celebration when the Japanese surrendered, or just did everybody expect that to happen? I, I, I really don't remember. I guess it probably was, but uh, you know, we were all going home, and uh, but uh, I don't remember any big celebration. That's it. I want to go back to something you mentioned early on that you were in Casablanca yeah. occasionally. Describe that experience. It was a different world. Uh, you know, seeing all these, I guess they were Arab people and Muslims or whatever, and they're all dressed funny in there. Yeah. Uh, Bloomers, as we called them, and, uh, but we didn't have any real contact with them. Uh, we got liberty once or twice. And, uh, you'd go in and go to some bar and have a drink, and that was about it. Uh, they uh, warned us about staying away from the women, mm -hmm. uh, but there, there wasn't a lot. Buy a few souvenirs. Yeah, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, you were discharged in um, September 1945, right? Yeah. And what did you do after that? Well, I went I went home, and uh, I don't know why, but I went to work for the post office. I thought, well, that's a good, yeah. you know, secure job. Of course. You, Back in 42 or 45, you didn't make any money. And I worked for the post office, I guess, for a year or two. Uh, well, until seven. And then I decided, well, maybe I ought to go to college. And I applied to the University of Florida. Went to Florida on the, I think I started in September of 47. And uh, graduated in. Uh, 51, summer of 51, but uh, I decided that'd be a better course of action, and I'm certainly glad I did now, but uh, got a degree in uh, business administration, uh, and a major in uh, insurance, and minor in accounting, uh, and then immediately after I say immediately after graduation, uh, uh, in October, in fact it was October the 1st, 51, I came to Atlanta and went to work with uh, Fidelity and Deposit Company, uh, which is an insurance and bonding company. They specialize in bonds, writing bonds for contractors. Uh, so I went to work with them. Uh, Stayed with them, still going. Stayed with them for uh, uh, for 27 years. Huh. It was a long time. Yeah. And you know, back in those days, you normally didn't you didn't have a lot of change in a job. You were, you were glad to have a job and uh, paying reasonable good money to uh, work for. But I uh, became stayed with them. And I, became uh, associate manager of their Atlanta branch office here. Uh, but uh, then I took early retirement and went to work for uh, a couple of big insurance brokerage firms here in Atlanta that specialize in writing bonds mm -hmm. for contractors. Uh, one of them was S. Hamlin Story Agency and the, the other was Yates Insurance Agency. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. The brother of Charlie Yates yeah. out here, yeah. Dan Yates, uh, and I'm still there, still working. Good man. Before we finish, I want to get a picture of your combat air team okay. and also the San Jacinto that you brought with us. Okay. And, uh, yeah, this 
Gary, who was the commanding officer of the squadron, he was 27 years old, and I thought he was an old man. Because, <laughs> you know, most of the pilots yeah. were, some of them were only, I guess some of them might have been 23, 24, 25. Which way you want That's to good right there. Uh, but he was 27, and I thought he said he's an old man. Because I was, uh, I was 20 at the time. Would you point to your picture in that group? This is me here. Okay. And this was George Fitzsimmons, who was a radio man. We flew together in VC-1 out in the Atlantic, and, uh, and we were together the whole time we were in the Pacific. Would you turn the, that page, and I believe there's a picture of the San Jacinto, and I'd like to get that. Uh, yes, this is this is the San Jacinto. It was a CVL. They called it a light carrier. You had three classes of carriers. You had the Jeep carriers, which were the small ones. Then you had the CVLs, which were all built off of cruiser hulls. They started out as cruisers. We needed aircraft carriers in a hurry. So uh, uh, there were nine of them. And then this was uh, showing the t different trips we made. Uh, but, uh, okay. Okay. Well, Mr. Meyer, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming in and sharing your experiences, and I'd like to give you a chance before we end the interview to just to say anything you would like to say about your military experience or anything else you'd like to put on the tape. I consider my military experience, I, I, I think it was a real good experience. Here I was, I was a young boy, just growing up, you know, uh, hadn't even started to shave. Uh, and uh, I thought it was a great, great time, a good time in the Navy. Uh, I'm kind of sorry I didn't apply for officer candidate school when I grew up, but I didn't know anything about about that at the time. And uh, uh, I just wanted to get in the Navy. I just I'd had a thing about uh, joining the Navy. Uh, so uh, I'm. Not sorry I did it. I mean, you, I'm sure you got a lot of people that are sorry they spend time in the service, but uh, not me. I'm, I'm glad I did, and I'm proud of my record. Well, you should be. Uh, I mean, you're a real hero. The things you did that you just described, uh, even though you don't realize it, <laughs> maybe it took a lot of courage and uh, sure meant a lot to the war effort. Well, there were, you know, there were a lot of other young boys that all did the same thing. And I'm just thankful I'm still alive to yeah. uh, recall a lot of this. Well, I'm, we are too, and uh, I want to thank you for coming today, but particularly thank you for the, your service yeah. to our country. And uh, it was an yeah, honor let me, to, let me to put on my hat. do that. Yeah. Let me put on my hat. Well, thank you very much again, and and uh, it was an honor to okay. to meet you and hear your story. My oldest son, uh, you know, he really took interest in me being in the Navy, the type of experience that I had. And then when he graduated from the University of Tennessee, he he decided he wanted well, he wanted to be a Navy pilot, but he he didn't qualify because of uh, curvature of the spine or something. But when he graduated from the University of Tennessee, he applied to OCS and was accepted. He's been in the Navy ever since. He's gone from ensign to uh, captain. And I'm, his mother and I are hoping that he'll make my side. Wow. We don't know, but uh, and right at this time, he's a 
professor at the National Defense Institute in Washington, D.C. Gosh. So, uh, well, I know you're proud of him. He's obviously proud of you because he followed in your footsteps. Well, of course, I have another son, too. I'm just as proud of him. He's an executive with UPS. Oh, and, right. Uh, that's great. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. That's my life story in one hour. Well, it's a wonderful story, and thank you for sharing it. Okay.